and you're live. So uh, good afternoon, everybody from a slightly overcast UK. Um, good morning to everyone in the States and good evening to everybody else who's uh, east of me. I see some really exciting locations in the chats. So we've got people from South Africa, from Norway, um, from Germany, from Montreal, uh, all over the world. Um, so pleased to, to have everybody here and um, I hope we're gonna entertain you with our uh, webinar on uh, low alcohol beer this afternoon. Um, at the end of the webinar, if um, we've got enough time, we're going to answer all the questions that you put in the chat. Uh, and we've also got some uh, digital polls that we're going to run. Um, so get ready for those at the end. There's going to be a little QR code that you can scan on your phone uh, and you'll be able to um, answer answer questions and we'll be able to see the answers in real time. So uh, exciting times. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk today uh, a little bit about uh, low alcohol beer, how it was done in the past. Um, how we recommend that you do it now, uh, and what might be coming uh, in the future. Uh, my colleague Abby in Montreal from an RD team is going to cover that uh, as well. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Andrew Paston, I should have introduced myself really. Um, I'm a degree educated brewer, um, and I've worked now with Laleman for the last four years. Uh, and one of my special products uh, within the company uh, has been low alcohol. Um, so this presentation is going to sum up some things that we've uh, kind of uh, some so far uh, and some of the things that are going to happen in the future. Uh, my colleague Avi is joining us today. Avi, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Avi um, and I live and work in Montreal at our R&D team or with our R&D team at um, at our facility based out of the National Research Council of Canada. And part of my job is to support these kinds of endeavors for developing new process process aids and yeast for all kinds of applications. Um, one of the really exciting things that's coming up are specifically the low alcohol beers. It's been really fun working with Andy on this. A uh, big part of it just has to do with just kind of manipulating biology to do what you want. And that's kind of my thing. Uh, my background is I'm a food scientist, um, got my graduate education from Oregon State University, uh, probably one of the, in my opinion, best food science universities uh, in North America. But yeah, I'm heavily biased in that regard. Um, so yeah, hopefully you guys will get something out of this and kind of learn about the exciting prospects that we have for the future of non-alcoholic beers. Cool, right, without further ado, let's, uh, let's, let's begin. So we're gonna have a short section on, on the past um, and how low alcohol beers were brewed in the past. Um, and these are beers that have probably been brewed like for quite a few years now. So you're probably talking that uh, the late 70s through into the early 90s when these beers were um, beginning to be produced. Um, and they were produced uh, by either restricted fermentations, so that would be ending your fermentation early, um, usually by the use of temperature, but sometimes also by centrifuging, filtration uh, to remove your yeast. Um, and, there, and also another method called cold contact fermentation. And that's a method where you would take wort and you add a very, very high concentration of yeast cells and you keep it agitated um, at very cold temperatures between zero and five degrees over the course of a few days. And both these methods allow uh, a form of restricted fermentation, which allows your yeast to create some flavor compounds. So it doesn't taste exactly like wort, but it still tastes quite a lot like wort. Um, and these beers um, have suffered uh, for a long time with, with various criticisms, um, which you can see on the screen now. Uh, one is that they're overly sweet, and that probably um, won't surprise us because if you're talking about a restricted fermentation, um, even if you're using um, a slightly modified wort, you're going to have quite a lot of fermentable sugar present uh, within your final beer. And uh, fermentable sugar, as we know, tastes sweet. Um, so you're going to get a beer that's, for all intents and purposes, really rather sweet. Um, they also tend to be thin or lack mouthfeel, and that's because if you're making a beer with a restricted fermentation, but there is still some fermentation, um, you're going to have to go with a lower sugar concentration than you might otherwise do uh, on a standard wort. And because of that, the beers are going to taste slightly dilute and slightly thin and maybe a little bit watery. So that's the second criticism. The final criticism, uh, beers are worthy. Um, so that's something that I'm going to explain a little further on, on the next slide, um, but more or less it um, is a criticism that means the beers taste like wort. Um, but what causes those flavors? 
So this is a fun slide here covered in uh, kind of molecules. Uh, and it just it shows the uh, the chemicals that are responsible for the worty flavors that we get um, in, in, a, in a fresh wort. And these are flavors that are actually um, quite nice in, 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 in large quantities. You know, if you have a nice glass of wort in the morning, if you're working in your brewery, you'll actually probably find it quite pleasant. Um, but they're inappropriate in a final beer. Uh, and they're one of the reasons that these local beers tend to taste a bit worthy. Now, on the left hand side of the screen here, you've got strecker aldehydes. Uh, and these are the, the real problem. So uh, these are products of reactions that take place within the kettle uh, and in the mash, and the reactions that take place between amino acids uh, and fatty acids. And they generally have flavors like malty, bready, caramelly. Um, so really quite nice, um, but as I said, not really appropriate in the final beer. The other aldehydes that we get um, on the right hand side of the screen are the product of malloid reactions, um, which are reactions between sugars and amino acids, which take place in the boil. Uh, these aren't quite such an issue. They tend to be reduced a little bit um, in contact with yeast, um, but they're still something that we need to bear in mind as, as we produce these uh, low alcohol beers. So one of the reasons these aldehydes stick around is because they are reduced naturally during fermentation by yeast. And in the case of a restricted or a cold contact fermentation, uh, this might not occur. Um, particularly in the case of cold contact fermentation, the branch streperaldehydes, the ones on the left hand side of the slide here, um, they tend to stick around. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that it's thought that they bind with flavonoids that come from hops and malt. Uh, and they do this especially well at cold temperatures. So if you're doing a cold contact fermentation and you have uh, a lot of these aldehydes there, they might actually not be available for the yeast to reduce down, even if you've got some limited yeast activity due to the um, restricted fermentation uh, or the cold contact. So there are other ways in which you can uh, help to remove these aldehydes. Um, one of those is, is sedimentation with PVPP or silica. Uh, and they just bind those flavonoids uh, and drop them out of solution. The next option is extended boil time. So despite the fact that we've got uh, greater numbers of these aldehydes within these low alcohol beers, you can actually mitigate that to a degree by having extended boil times. They're still volatile, you know, you can smell them, they're very flavor active, so an increased boil time can boil them off. And finally, and this is probably an option more for a larger brewery than it is for a small one, you can look at work stripping. Um, so that would be a, a technology where you allow wort to flow down a column and rising up the column at the same time as the wort flows down, you'll have either steam or nitrogen or carbon dioxide and they will uh, strip the volatiles from the, uh, from the wort and, and leave you with less aromatic aldehydes uh, in your final product. So that was the past, and it's certainly the case that there are many of these beers that are still around. Um, cold contact is still used, as is restricted fermentation. Um, but it's not something that I'd necessarily recommend um, for a low alcohol beer process, um, and especially not in a, a smaller brewery. Um, so I've designed uh, over the last few years, this kind of uh, graphic on the right hand side, this mechanism for producing a good tasting uh, low alcohol beer. And it's basically a holistic process. You have to look at all the different steps within beer production to get something that tastes good. Now, what we recommend as, as a starting uh, point for, for most breweries is a combined method. Um, and that is a combined method of high temperature mashing in conjunction uh, with low original gravity wort. Um, not really low, so it tastes wor worthy, but still relatively low compared with maybe a, a, a normal beer. And doing that in conjunction with using uh, multi-trios negative yeast. And we'll come to why we recommend yeasts for that purpose uh, in the next few slides. So to start with, we're going to talk about hot mashing. Now, now why would we do hot mashing? Um, and this slide is an example of the uh, sugars that you would find within a normal wort. Uh, and just to kind of go over the jargon with you, you've got glucose at the top on the left, which is DP1, uh, which stands for degree of polymerization one. Um, and then as you go through the sugars present within the brew fermentation, you have maltose, DP2, which is just two glucose units joined together, and maltochiose DP3, which is three uh, glucose units joined together. Now, they will normally make up the vast majority of fermentable sugars within a brewery wort. As well as this, you get some unfermentable material, um, dextrin or anything above DP4, uh, and yeast aren't able to touch that. They aren't able to use that for fermentation. Uh, 
So just looking at this slide, we can see that our standard brewery work is between 75% and 95% fermentable. Um, and if you have a very fermentable work like that, if you add a standard yeast or even a specialist yeast, you're going to end up with a, a degree of alcohol production, which if we're trying to make low alcohol beer, it's not ideal. Um, so we need to look at a process um, where we can modify the uh, work sugars which exist within our work. And that process is hot mashing. Um, so the next slide, I'm going to look at um, hot mashing and kind of explain how the process works. So some of you may have come across in, in the past the brewer's window, um, and that's illustrated on this slide by the purple box. Uh, and that's the temperature of mashing, um, usually in single fusion mashing, which is um, commonly used uh, in microbreweries and in, in the British kind of brewing system. And that's the temperature at which beta amylase and alpha amylase are at their optimum um, to create a highly fermentable wort. And fermentability is, uh, uh, is represented here by the, the blue dashed line in the middle of the slide. And you can see between 64 and 70 degrees, you get a very highly fermentable wort because those enzymes are very active. Now, the key enzymes that you're looking here are, are alpha and beta amylase, and beta amylase is the enzyme that is responsible for the most fermentable sugar production. So beta amylase creates maltose, um, which is this sugar here, the two unit sugar, um, and alpha amylase breaks up chains of starch into smaller pieces, um, which means there's more substrate for the uh, beta amylase to then work on. Now, if we mash at a higher temperature, um, beyond the optimum temperature at which beta amylase works, we can cause it to be inactivated, the protein starts to denature. And in doing so, we can uh, lower the fermentability of our resultant wort. Um, but importantly, we can still uh, break down some of the starch within the grains because the alpha amylase, which is represented by the, the green line, is still active. Um, so we recommend mashing between 76 and 82 degrees Celsius. And I'll go into some of the proof uh, behind why we uh, recommend those temperatures in the following slides. But essentially, the idea between, uh, behind hot mashing is that we get less of the fermentable sugars on the left here, more of these longer chain sugars and dextrins, and therefore less in the way of ethanol production. So that's hot mashing. I just wanted to present a tiny bit of experimental work that we've done um, with hot mashing technique just to show you how it works. So we did this uh, at um, our process aids um, kind of business uh, called AB Vickers in Burton on Trent, uh, where they've got mash baths. So we can do uh, different mash temperatures and different mash times. So this work is all based around uh, a seven and a half place of work um, where we did five different mash times and five different mash temperatures. So these are the initial results. On the left hand slide, we just have um, sample numbers and we have the, um, the mash temperatures on the top and the mash times on the left. Uh, and then on the right hand side of the slide, we've got uh, what is known as an iodine test. And on the left hand side of the uh, picture, we've got the mash temperatures and on the top, we've got the mash times. And what you can see is starch breakdown. I should really explain this first. Uh, when you've got starch and you've got iodine, uh, you see a black color, right? So if you add them together, you get a black color. Whereas if you've got fermentable sugar, or you've got starch that's been broken down, you see a, a pale kind of gold color. So this picture represents um, by change of color, the, the level of starch that is present. So going back to the, the temperatures on the left, um, you've got 74 degrees, 78 degrees, 82 degrees, 86 degrees, and 95 degrees. Those are the mash temperatures that we used. Uh, and then on the top, we've got uh, the mash time. So 60 minutes, 70 minutes, 80 minutes, and 90 minutes. And the first conclusion we can probably draw is that the process seems to be rather uh, independent of um, mashing time. And that's likely because um, we started at 60 uh, and continued mashing for longer. If we'd uh, gone for shorter periods of time, we'd probably see a, a slightly different result. The second conclusion we can draw is that at 86 and 95 degrees, we've got an awful lot of starch present because the, the droplets that we've used with the work there have turned black in the presence of iodine. If we look at 74 and 78 degrees, you can see that we've got uh, quite a bit of starch breakdown. Um, at 74, you can't really see any colour change in the work at all. Um, indicating the presence of large amounts of fermentable sugar and not very much starch. At 78, it starts to get a little bit darker, which would indicate that we've got some starch uh, appearing. And then at 82, you get this nice sort of brick red colour. Um, and that indicates that you've got some uh, long chain dextrins uh, present, um, but not uh, full starch, as you see with 86 and 95 degrees. Um, so this is between 78 and 82 is probably the target temperature that you want to target for, um, for hot mashing. <laughs> 
just a, a little bit further justification here, this is a heat map um, showing the different concentrations of the sugars that are present within the works that we tested. Um, just to explain it a little bit, at the top you've got HMW, that stands for high molecular weight. Um, and then as we've seen before, DP3 um, is maltotriose, um, which is the three glucose unit fermentable sugar within wort. Uh, DP2, which is maltose, uh, which is the two glucose unit sugar, and then DP1, which is glucose. And if we have high uh, concentrations of those sugars, we're gonna have fermentation, uh, we're gonna have alcohol production, uh, and we're not gonna have a low alcohol beer. So this uh, map just indicates the concentrations by uh, way of the, the intensity of the red color. So at 74 degrees, you can see that we have uh, quite a highly intense red color, um, which indicates that we've got a lot of that fermentable sugar there. And as we go up through 78 and 82, um, the DP2, 3 and 1 start to drop, it gets paler, and the high molecular weight column gets darker, which indicates that you've got more complex dextrins and more starch there. Um, as you go up through the, uh, the temperatures, you can see that you get almost no fermentable sugar. So at 86 degrees, it's basically white. Um, and you've got an also lot of starch, which probably means it's going to be uh, too starchy um, and you're going to get processing problems. Then at 95 degrees, you actually have a bit more fermentable sugar coming back again. And that's likely due to starch hydrolysis just due to, through, due to high temperatures. Um, so that gives us, again, a bit more kind of um, ammo to say that's that's where we want to ferment uh, between 78 and 82. Um, the final slide goes into a bit more detail. We're looking here at the different uh, sugars from DP1 all the way up to DP7. So that's uh, glucose, maltose, maltotriose, uh, maltotetraose, uh, maltopentose, and then going up through six, seven, all the way up to high molecular weight. And you can see the yellow uh, line, which is represented there by 82 degrees of matching. And you can see where it, where it lies uh, at DP2, you've got this peak, which isn't the, uh, isn't the highest, it's probably the second lowest. And as you come up through DP3, DP4, DP5, it's also quite low. And you get this sort of peak around DP6 and 7, um, which would indicate we've got quite a good starch breakdown, um, but not too much in the way of fermentable sugar production. So just even more evidence that that's a good temperature to match at. There is actually another slide, which I haven't included this time around, which goes all the way up to DP30, which gives a really interesting picture um, of, the, of the different sugars that exist in the works that we um, tested. But it's a, it's a little bit complex to try and present over, uh, over a presentation, so I haven't included it this time around. So that was hot mashing. That was the justification for hot mashing. Um, but if you're doing a low alcohol beer, there's other work production considerations as well. Um, so one would be the malt bill, right? So if you're making a uh, low alcohol wort uh, and you're looking to maximize the amount of unfermentable sugar there, as well as using uh, hot mashing, which is going to modify your, your sugars, you can also modify the different sugar contents by using uh, malts that contain a lot of unfermentable material. Um, so that'd be your roasted or caramelized malts. Um, and they can actually help a little bit um, with pH adjustment, as we'll see later. Um, that is quite important. So. Some of those malts contain lots of unfermentable material and also some of them are quite acidic. So also something that's worth considering. As I said, the wort strength we used there um, was seven and a half Plato. So you do need to go uh, quite low. Um, if you go high, then obviously you're gonna get um, more alcohol production, um, but you could dilute downstream if you needed to. So if you wanted to go in at high wort strength, you could. Um, hopping rates, I would always consider hopping rates. Uh, and that's mainly because uh, there's not much body in these beers. There's not much alcohol there. So if you go too heavy on hopping rates, it can taste unbalanced and bitter. Um, so I would always go on the low side with the hopping rates. Um, boil times and additions, as we've already spoken about, um, aldehydes um, are influenced by boil times and additions. So if you want to reduce some of those aldehydes down, you can look at PVP additions and extended uh, boil times. Liquor salts, the final one here, uh, that's looking at things like chloride. Um, so chloride can accentuate mouthfeel. So if you have a beer that's um, thin or a bit watery already, you can add some extra calcium and that will give you a mouthfeel a bit of a boost. Um, another one that I've not included here is actually carbonation. So if you have a more fizzy beer, it fills the mouth a bit more and it can help with um, beers that don't have much of a mouthfeel. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is the yeast. Um, so the choice of organism that you use for fermentation. Now, 
If you're looking at brewing yeast, um, you've got two options really, and they're represented by the, the first two in the table that I've got there. So a standard ale or lager yeast uh, will ferment your glucose, it will ferment your maltose, and it will ferment your maltotriase. So you could use that with hot matching. It's going to be harder to get a low alcohol content because it ferments all the sugars that are present in the wort. Uh, but you can do it, um, particularly if you dilute after fermentation. Next, I would look at strains that are maltotriose negative, so that's that they don't ferment the three glucose unit sugar. They're actually quite common, um, even amongst genetic brewing strains, it's quite common to have a maltotriose negative strain, um, particularly among traditional English ale yeasts, it's a, a common characteristic. Uh, and we have uh, actually three strains within our catalogue um, which don't ferment maltotriose. Um, those are Windsor um, and London, which are based on the screen, um, both of which are traditional English ale yeasts. Um, but then we also have uh, a genetic wine yeast, our CBC1, um, which also doesn't ferment maltotriose. And there's a slightly less estuary flavour, so it can be used probably for low alcohol lager production. Um, so that would probably be my recommendation uh, to use a maltotriose negative yeast in the first instance. Looking beyond maltotriose negative yeast, you can also look at maltose negative yeasts. Um, so these tend not to be uh, genetic brewing yeasts, but it is a characteristic of some uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so it's the Revisio strains that exist within the, the wine and baking worlds um, that don't ferment maltose. Uh, usually these are things that are genetically uh, grown in environments which contain lots of fermentable, uh, simple fermentable sugars, so things like glucose, fructose, um, that sort of thing. Um, and there are many of those available, and it's one of the things that uh, we are looking at within Lanham is whether we can launch a maltose negative, uh, low alcohol specific yeast. So I kind of already went through this, but um, your fermentation options would be a standard fermentation uh, with a maltose negative yeast. Um, I wouldn't do that because if you haven't done a hot mashing technique and you just use a maltose negative yeast, it's going to taste sweet, which takes us back to kind of our holistic view. So you need to do something about the fermentable sugar if you're going to use a maltose negative yeast. You can't just use it on its own. Um, then you've got uh, standard fermentation with maltotriose negative yeast and hot mashing, which is what I would do at this point. Um, it creates a nice flavour. You still get some, some yeast-derived flavour compounds uh, and you get a reasonable low alcohol content. Then you could look at cold contact fermentation still. Um, it's commonly used with lager yeast, um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it's going to give you a sweet fermentation if you don't take steps to mitigate the fact that there's going to be a lot of fermentable sugar there, much like if you were to use a maltose negative yeast. And then finally, there's some other options. So you could look at utilizing some lactic acid bacterial yeast. So it's actually quite uh, common for the lactic acid bacterial lactic acid producing yeast to utilize glucose to produce lactic acid prior to an alcoholic fermentation. So in using those, not only do you drop the pH, um, you can actually deplete the glucose content to a degree, um, which means that you have less fermentable sugar and perhaps uh, will end up with less alcohol. Final option, you could look at using non-saccharomyces yeasts. Um, so there's quite a lot of these um, that have been studied. Um, and actually, there's an awful lot of papers looking at the possible use of non-saccharomyces yeasts within a brewing environment. Um, and the reason that they're looked at in such great detail is because it's quite um, unusual for non-saccharomyces yeast to ferment uh, maltose or maltotriose. So you can create a, or you can produce a yeast that only ferments glucose relatively easily. Um, some of these are also uh, supposed to produce quite a lot in the way of flavour compounds during the limited fermentation that you'd see. Um, so one that you may have heard of is the Saccharomyces Ludwigi strain, um, and we do have one of those within our collection. Um, there's probably, to be honest, the jury's out on which strain is the best strain because there's so many of them that have been studied. Sorry about this. Let me um, let me change that. Go away. <laughs> So next I've got one slide on alcohol removal of dilution. Um, I work for a biotechnology company, so I'm talking about the biological side of low alcohol beer production, um, but there are other ways to do it as well. Um, Technology-based ways, uh, so things that require you to invest in uh, machinery. Um, so the two kind of technologies that are used most commonly are reverse osmosis, which is a membrane-based technique where you essentially uh, concentrate your beer by removing the water from it. And then after you've removed the water from it, you flush the alcohol um, out with um, uh, with our, uh, distilled water, uh, and then you would uh, add the water back in again to reconstitute it and stop it being uh, a concentrated product. Um, so that's quite a useful technique if you want to create beer that's uh, probably about 0.5% alcohol or slightly lower. Um, if you want to create something that's absolutely 0% alcohol, 
um, you'd have to look at um, evaporation technologies. Uh, and the leaders in, in that regard are falling film uh, techniques. Um, and you can either have falling film where you have beer falling down pipes in a very, very thin layer with steam um, heading up and that evaporates the alcohol. Um, or you can have centrifugal evaporators where the uh, beer is spread out very thinly across a, a spinning disc, uh, which is heated uh, by steam and it drives the alcohol off. Um, both those techniques involve some heating of the beer, um, so they're thermal processes. Um, they're not as hot as they used to be in years gone by. Um, they now take place between about 40 and 60 degrees under vacuum, um, but it used to be that they had to run at very high temperatures to move alcohol. But if you want to create uh, alcohol-free, completely no alcohol, that's, that's one of the ways in which you can do it. Um, even using the biological techniques, sometimes you'll find that your alcohol content is too high for your intended purpose. So if you wanted to reduce that down, you would look to uh, dilute, um, probably with deaerated liquor to prevent there being any oxidation um, during the dilution process. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about pH correction. Um, pH correction is uh, something that has to be done with local beers. Um, you can quite often have high pHs uh, in a low alcohol beer um, for several reasons. Um, if you've got low alcohol worts, um, you've not used very much malt, uh, there's a limited um, buffering capacity, um, and that can lead to the pH rising throughout the process as you're sparging. At the same time, during fermentation, uh, yeast can uh, drop and yeast can and will drop the pH as they create organic acids. Um, now, in a limited fermentation or restricted fermentation, you're not going to see uh, too much of that. So you might end up with a, a high pH at the end of the fermentation process. Uh, and that's a problem because it tends to have flavor effects. So you can have astringent and tannic worts. Um, you can get high perceived bitterness um, due to the high pH. And you can get poor microbiological stability because the pH is too high. Um, so I would look to correct this at all stages of the process. Um, you can correct with food grade acid and you can do it uh, in the mash, you can do it post boil and I would definitely do it uh, post fermentation as well just to make sure that you've got um, a good beer pH and there you'd be looking anywhere between uh, 3.8 and 4. Um, you don't really want to go any higher than that. Um, the other thing that you can do is when you're sparging you can drop the uh, pH of the sparge water down to in the region of 5 5.2 um, so you don't see much of a pH rise as you start to sparge through the grain bed and you won't uh, dissolve so many bitter and tannic substances. Um, the other thing which you can do which I've seen people do before is just top up with water so you do your initial runoff um, of, of the of the mash tun or the lighter tun uh, and then you top up with water that's been treated to um, proper uh, word pH. Now, when you're making low alcohol beers, you're actually, um, it's probably in some respects more akin to making a, a soft drink, right? So you can use uh, several different acids for your um, pH adjustment. Um, in brewing, we like to use sulfuric, hydrochloric, and lactic, but those aren't the only acids you can use. You can use other food grade acids as well. Uh, and if you look to um, soft drinks, um, phosphoric acid, malic acid, and citric acid are all used um, for similar purposes um, they also all have different flavors um, so it's something you can use to add uh, you know uniqueness to your particular product you can use a different acid and therefore influence the flavor in that way now the final kind of prong on my uh, diagram that i want to talk about is stabilization and it's quite an important thing um, to talk about um, with low alcohol beers um, if you think about a regular beer, um, it tends to be microbiologically quite stable, and that's because it's uh, nutritionally poor. Um, it contains alcohol, it has a low pH, and it contains um, hop acids, which are antimicrobial. Um, and these are all depleted um, or altered to a degree in low alcohol beer, and therefore we've got a product um, which is susceptible um, to spoilage, both by beer spoilers and possibly um, pathogens. So there are a few uh, papers out there which suggest that pathogens survive better in, in low alcohol beer um, and you don't want to be making people ill so you need to look at ways to stabilize those products. Now the gold standard and it's probably unpopular among craft brewers is uh, tunnel pasteurization. Um, unpopular for two reasons, it's expensive, uh, they are quite large uh, and in times gone past, if you've had uh, relatively poor dissolved oxygen in your in your uh, final beer, you can actually cause quite a lot of thermal damage to your beers. Um, these days, you can get smaller ones; they are available. Uh, and if you've got control, good control on your dissolved oxygen, it's probably something to wor uh, worth considering. Uh, 
although there are very few out there in craft brews that I've seen. I think I've seen two. Um, flask pasteurization is also an option. Um, it's got a lower uh, footprint and it's a much easier to implement in your brewery, um, but there is a risk to contamination uh, during packaging. Uh, during packaging. Um, if you're using a tunnel pasteurizer, obviously it's already in pack, so you don't have to worry about the uh, beer being contaminated at a later date. Uh, it's sealed and it will remain sealed. Um, flash pasteurization does leave you open to um, contamination during the packaging process. Um, you could also look at chemical stabilizers. Um, so like with acids, when I spoke about soft drinks, it's kind of common in soft drinks to use um, chemical stabilizers to um, stabilize your product. Uh, ones that you can look at are sorbate benzoates and sulfur dioxide. Now you would need to check the regulations in your local jurisdictions to understand whether or not uh, they're gonna be allowed to be used. Uh, and it's also important to note that most of these um, work better at lower pHs. So it lends um, even more weight to your uh, pH correction. And um, if you want to use those, you need to make sure that your pH is in the right range for them to actually work. Um, I've put one point in here about the potential use of high pressure pasteurization in the future. I think there's a few academic papers out there on this, um, but it's not coming anytime soon. These are machines where you pressurize your product to very, very high pressures. You're talking in the range of like 6,000 bar um, and that uh, pasteurizes the product. Um, I don't think it's probably going to be uh, a realistic opportunity for craft breweries, but it's still something to keep an eye on. It's something that's interested. Um, just to kind of final, uh, complete this slide, that some of the quoted pasteurization units for um, low and alcohol beers are very high. So way in a standard ale or lager, you might look somewhere between 20 and 35 PUs. Uh, in the case of a low alcohol beer, you're talking 40 to 60 PUs. And in the case of a no alcohol beer, you're talking 80 to 100 PUs. So they're actually... Um, very, very high. So just to sum up my um, part of the presentation before moving on to Abby, I would recommend if you're going to make a uh, low alcohol beer, you should consider all parts of the process, take a holistic approach, uh, put in the effort on the R&D plant, um, but try and get it right um, before you launch it. Don't just kind of hit and hope and try and launch something uh, straight away. It's going to take a bit of work um, to get it right. I would recommend you do high temperature mashing uh, using multi-trials negative yeast as a first instance. And I would definitely look at pH correction and I would definitely look at stabilization. Um, so that's the way I would do it. Um, please, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat um, or feel free to get in touch and uh, contact me afterwards. Um, so that's my part. I think we're gonna now uh, go over to Abby and he's gonna talk about what might happen in the future with low alcohol beers. All right, thank you. Hmm. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm leaving the mouse on the wrong <laughs> screen. <laughs> right. No worries. All right. <clears throat> So thank you, Andy. Um, great presentation. So now we're going to move on to uh, alternative methods rather than physical or mechanical controls of producing um, non-alcoholic or low alcoholic beers. Uh, so when it comes to doing a more biological approach or a more um, biotechnical approach, it's important to uh, consider your microbial selection. Uh, so one of the things that Andy touched upon early on was uh, there are uses for standard brewing Saccharomyces cerevisiae or fermentation Saccharomyces cerevisiae, particularly those found in wine or in baking. Um, but there are other options out there that he alluded on. Uh, <clears throat> So we have our established lineages of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, and we have our quote unquote non-traditional microorganisms or what we would consider non-standard microorganisms. And then we also have um, alternative methods through the use of modern biotechnology, such as uh, directed evolution through um, hybridization or through direct bioengineering. So, one of the important things that I always like to talk about when people want to brew some kind of low to no alcohol beer is what are you trying to produce? Um, 
because ultimately it's very difficult to produce a perfectly uh you know like a perfect carbon copy so to speak of a full strength beer but with no alcohol um but also are your target audience is calorically conscious um are, are you aiming towards a different crowd uh, what's your demographic? Are you looking to produce maybe more of a malt soda-like beverage or perhaps a barley hop tea or even something like a, what you could consider a probiotic health tonic? So all these things need to be taken into consideration when you're first starting out or when you're first planning a new product. Um, and again, so microbial selection is important. And to touch back upon what what Andy was talking about is that there are uh, brewing strains that are available on the market right now um, that are multi-trials negative that are incapable of fermenting multi-trials um, and also ones that are incapable of uptaking and using uh, maltose but maltose negative yeast are a bit harder to use especially considering that um, in a standard wort, you know, as much as 40% of the fermentable sugars or even more in some cases uh, will be maltose. Uh, and they may also come with other issues um, such as using wine strains. Um, you could encounter strange off flavors just due to the biochemistry of the wine yeast itself is more suited towards a, you know, like a fruit must rather than um, a grain extract because there's uh, all all kinds of other compounds that are being extracted along with the sugars as well and that's something that you do have to take into consideration but that being said you know you could still accomplish quite a bit with um, the proper strain you know with a proper saccharomyces cerevisiae strain uh, such as the uh, london and windsor uh, brands through lalaman um, uh, but again you know, it's ethanol is still very important for the flavor perception. And one of the things that I do like to bring up is that when you're producing a low alcohol beer, it's that a good chunk of the flavor perception does come from the presence of ethanol. So the way that ethanol plays a role, the interactions with the chemical compounds that are already present within the fermented substrate significantly alter how we as humans will perceive them. So moving on to uh, non-traditional organisms. So the practice of monoculture brewing is actually pretty new when you're taking into the into account the whole history of brewing. So, you know, we're talking like 9,000, 10,000 years of brewing culture that has developed. Um, and for the vast majority of that, they were essentially mixed cultures or very complex fermentation ecosystems. And going back to low alcohol fermentations or a low alcohol product, um, in a sense, is kind of returning back to these deep roots of brewing practices. So we're, we're actually going back in time. And it's, it's really interesting to kind of think about like, you know, the earliest beers probably weren't super alcoholic to begin with, maybe two to 3%. Um, and there's a ton of other common genre of yeast and other microorganisms that can be found within these fermentations. Um, and there was a special emphasis placed on Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This was something that just kind of like happen to thrive within these human-made environments and evolve into what we have today to the point where now you know brewers are super strict on what they use we're doing monocultural fermentations um, but i think a lot of us do tend to forget that you know this practice is maybe 150 years old uh probably younger i mean we'd look at um the traditional stout um, where part of the character, this is a, a very classically British beer, uh, and part of the character, the traditional character of these beers actually comes from Britannomyces, which we now consider a spoilage organism. Uh, but Britannomyces, 
translates from Latin to British fungus. It's a, it's a British sugar fungus. It's a British yeast. Uh, but it was originally isolated and found within these porters and stouts that were developed in Great Britain. So again, like even 150 years ago, we were still seeing these mixed fermentations. Um, and now there's a growing body of research that provides a whole wealth of information in making use of what we would consider these non-traditional microorganisms uh, for unconventional and low alcohol beers. Uh, so as previously mentioned, sometimes we, we may want uh, a particular flavor or aroma to kind of help cover up those wordy flavors that come from these low alcohol beers. Um, and one of the things that we do want to look into or that we are actively looking into are say the functional properties of many of these species or many of these genre of yeast and how they can confer um, different flavors different advantages and maybe different functional properties than a standard saccharomyces cerevisiae so you know, we could do something to enhance a particular flavor or maybe improve fermentation temperature or maybe add a little organic acid, um, different enzymes that's activities that can help further break down other compounds or other components of the beers and the hop, or sorry, the malt and the hops, um, as well as providing antioxidants for, uh, to help stabilize and protect the flavor. Um, and even making use of external or extra carbon sources that normally wouldn't be used by your standard Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, so basically what, what the goal is for a lot of this modern research is kind of looking into metabolic pathways that can convert these base nutrients into other metabolites that aren't ethanol um, into manageable quantities of other desirable flavor characteristics. Um, so when we're looking at metabolism as a whole, there's a whole lot that can be done using just glucose and amino acids. Um, ethanol is just one direction that this could possibly take. Uh, it just happens to be a very enjoyable and a very important part of your typical beer. Um, so the use of novel biotechnology can kind of help overcome that as well, kind of like combine these bests of both worlds. So, you know, you have your standard brewing practices and you have your, what we would consider non-traditional or uh, non-conventional brewing practices in a modern sense. Um, and these can come in two basic forms that, that we'll cover today. So we have what we call our artificial hybrids, as well as our bioengineered yeast. So artificial hybrids are, it's, it's a development, sorry, it's a development method. Um, to put it lightly, it's a form of guided breeding. So this is where microbiologists and biochemists can actually force mate desired characteristics or phenotypes um, through a very iterative process. Uh, it tends to be, not, nowadays, it, it tends to be very high throughput. It's, it's actually quite easy to kind of come up with like a whole slew of colonies, a whole slew of, of individual clones uh, that can then be processed for um, their fermentative capabilities, their, their um, uh, sensory characteristics, uh, and just how they perform in the standard brewing environment. So this method is actually currently in use today to create all kinds of novel hybrids um, in many different industries. This isn't just limited to brewing. It's, it's uh, quite useful in winemaking, biofuels, baking, anything that really uses some kind of fermentation um, as, you know, as far removed from brewing as um, pharmaceuticals. Um, so uh, this method has successfully created organisms that can withstand very high ethanol, uh, create a lot of ethanol, modulate biotransformative enzyme excretion, um, and be built for specific organoleptic properties. But 
one of the major drawbacks of this is as far as a product development cycle goes, um, if you're looking for something for really improved flavor or functionality and something as, I, I, as I would put it, like maybe as delicate as beer, uh, because we tend to skew more towards a monoculture unlike other fermentations, um, we're very particular. Breweries tend to be very particular about like how clean the process is and how efficient the process is uh, compared to something like um, wine, you know, or um, even biofuels. The biofuels, their primary concern is ethanol efficiency, right? So they don't care about flavor. They don't care about um, anything else. It's more whether or not all that carbon is being put into ethanol. So like organoleptic properties, don't matter. I mean, we've tested biofuel strains for brewing, and I can tell you some of them are pretty gross. <laughs> it's like no, no, um, no care in the world at all for uh, flavor. But you know, they don't have to worry about that. It's more about getting as much as that carbon converted to ethanol as possible. Whereas uh, in brewing, we want a very fine balance of ethanol and other metabolites to kind of help balance that flavor, that aroma. Um, so, so this is just a, a really interesting diagram uh, that I personally love because uh, part of my main interests are the history and evolution of brewing over human history. And the most successful hybrid in use today is Saccharomyces pastorianus. So this is a, what we could consider a natural hybrid. It kind of arose from very particular man-made um, environmental alterations that allowed these particular hybrids to flourish. But it just shows that, you know, this is something that's possible. Um, and at, you know, when you're dealing with it at a natural scale like this, it's a numbers game. Uh, so at some point, something like this was going to arise uh, just through human inter intervention alone, whether directed or not. But it's just really interesting to see that we do have a lot of really neat natural uh, examples of the usefulness of hybrids. So again, just to reiterate, these artificial hybrids, um, they're capable of introducing new genetic material and new traits into a you know, rather stagnant um, family, I guess, of, of yeast. We do have a fairly rapid development cycle just because the technology is improving and it's getting a lot cheaper. Um, and we can introduce all kinds of new traits, new behaviors to develop new products uh, and ultimately resulting in new strains. And this is a this is an iterative process, though. Um, so it can become time consuming, especially like if it's something you're really trying to look for something very particular, uh, very niche, very you know, ultimately perfect. Uh, so it can take some time. Um, and then moving on from there, we kind of take a look into the bioengineering aspect of it. So this is more of a further out future endeavor, kind of like looking at the sustainability and the ult ultimately the acceptance of bioengineering a strain specifically for uh, a purpose like low to no alcohol beers. So one of the things about bioengineering today is that um, it really mostly exists as a proof of concept in the brewing world. We do have some some interesting examples. There are some strains out on the market right now, currently only available in the U.S. markets. But you know we have things like uh, Sour Vizier, uh, which is a bioengineered strain to produce lactic acid. Um, we also have or not us, not, not Lalaman, but there are other strains out there through like uh, companies like Omega and Berkeley Group that produce, um, you know, that suppress certain metabolic pathways to allow for, say, um, higher thiol release or uh, linalool expression or other terpenoid expressions um, that would normally be found in hop material. But in, really what, what these baseline bioengineering projects go is they're just kind of either suppressing current uh, metabolic pathways or introducing extra metabolic pathways by like say cloning already 
present genes within the genome to just kind of boost that genetic activity. Uh, but one of the advantages of, of bioengineering compared to, say, um, hybridization is that it can be much more directed and much more precise. Uh, really, the main downside is, is that it kind of suffers from the weakest rate of acceptance. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of misgivings currently globally about um, things like bioengineered products and uh, just due to ethical considerations and the concern of consumer transparency. People want to know what they're getting in a product. So this is all stuff that we do have to take into account. Um, but from a, uh, from a biotechnical standpoint, um, I mean, bioengineered yeast have been in use in industry for decades. Uh, so one of the earliest work was performed in the early 1980s. Uh, this was specifically to enhance beta glucanase activity in industrial brewing to improve filtration performance. So essentially what this was done, um, uh, this was just produced to enhance brewery efficiency at a very large scale. So, you know, you're talking about a million hectoliters where even shaving off 1% of an inefficient process could result in hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings each year. Um, later work tended to central, or sorry, tended to be centered around modification of existing metabolic pathways. So these were metabolic pathways that or, already exist in the yeast. Um, and in this case here, this, this super interesting paper, um, helping improve the uh, primary flavor of hopped beer. This is just taking advantage of already existing metabolic pathways and kind of just tweaking them or or cloning them to enhance their their capabilities to basically start producing these um, substrates for improved hop aroma. Um, or here we have the complete biosynthesis of cannabinoids, and they're what we call their unnatural analogs in yeast. And identification of novel alleles conferring superior product of rose, fav rose flavor phenylethyl acetate using uh, polygenic analysis in yeast. So this is kind of using um, the CRISPR-Cas9 to be extremely precise in how these uh, basically gene consets were, were manipulated. And finally, we come on recombinant gene uh, DNA technology, which is probably like the most, um, I guess this would be considered the most uh, controversial uh, because this is where transgenic gene technology is where you're actually introducing foreign DNA into another into another organism, uh, particularly with, with microbes, though they tend to be extremely promiscuous with their DNA um, and are often swapping. Uh, that's how we have what we refer to as horizontal gene transfer, where you have kind of uh, D or DNA uptake and DNA swapping between genera. Uh, this happens all the time in the bacterial world. It's not as common in the yeast world, but it does happen. But it can result in some really interesting capabilities for these fermentative organisms. And one of the things that we really want to look at is, um, is there a way to either hybridize out ethanol production or introduce novel genetic pathways that either divert carbon sources from producing ethanol and into say another organoleptically important side product um, so phenylethyl acetate or isoamyl acetate uh, those are very important compounds for just the normal perception of beer. And there's actually been some really interesting studies in balancing that by either like artificially spiking beer that had been stripped of its alcohol and kind of trying to find that really perfect or ideal concentration of these aromatic compounds, or sorry, of these aroma compounds, um, to kind of balance that 
weird kind of brothy wordy flavor that Andy was talking about in the first part of this uh, webinar. Uh, because really when it comes down to it, it's um, with without ethanol, without the presence of, of alcohol of any kind or the kind that, you know, gets us drunk, um, flavor perception is astoundingly skewed uh, just because of, of how even 5% ABV um, can affect flavor perception um, and the concentration of these significant metabolites that play a role in how humans perceive these normal flavors in beer. So uh, really at the end of the day, you got you, you kind of got to consider like what is your primary goal and what are you willing to do and what are you willing to use? So uh, in the future, there are going to be some really cool products coming out. Um, if not through Lalamon, then then another company will definitely be able to be able to take advantage of that, but will either be able to offer um, alternative microorganisms just through bioprospecting, um, the creation of novel hybrids through forced breeding, um, or the creation of entirely novel strains through the introduction of bioengineering. Um, and the current advances at which this kind of biotechnology is advancing, I feel that this is something that's going to be happening in the very near future. I mean, there's already instances of proprietary um, processes that are still kind of kind of behind lock and key. But I could tell you that like these no or these no to low alcohol beers, like uh, the way that they're produced, they're using these um, really cool technologies that will slowly start to become more and more viable at the smaller scale. Uh, so it's really something to keep an eye out for. Um, and it's something that I'm personally like super excited to work on just because we're kind of entering into this new era of one where people are becoming more and more health conscious that is affecting the sales of beers overall. Um, however, it's combined with this revolution in computational biochemistry where things are becoming like say these hybridization techniques are becoming much faster, much cheaper, where we may not even have to rely on things like bioengineering. However, I still personally believe that bioengineering will still play an important role, especially if, um, you know, we're getting to a point now where, uh, Sustainability is is becoming more and more of an issue. Um, having to take into account issues like uh, changing climate, availability of of ingredients um, such as hop and barley and other grains, um, and brewers are going to have to adapt. And uh, you know with shifts in demographics, shifts in sales. Um, ultimately, I think that that stuff like this will 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 catch on. Um, we do see some really some some really high interest in either like just the novel characteristics of it um, or the capabilities of other microorganisms. Um, so, yeah, really, um, it's good. It's just going to come down to remaining engaged with your customers, remaining engaged with the industry and just seeing what's out there. So for that, I will wrap up and uh, we had pre we have a a poll prepared so we can engage further engage with questions and hopefully provide you some really interesting answers. So before we go over to the poll, because um, I think it's going to be live on my screen, um, what I would say is scan the the barcode that's on the screen as you see it right now. It will give you a. Uh, 30 seconds or so to, to do that. Uh, and then I'll share my screen and we can see the results. Um, we're gonna have four questions. Mm -hmm. Avi, I think you need to turn your share off. Yep. Cool, so this is our first question. 
I agree with the 4% though, personally. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask. So it's about 50, 50. Yeah. yeah. With a small percentage that think it's blasphemy. I'm, I'm actually pretty surprised uh, just because of the difficulty of, of producing a low alcohol beer. Yeah. I mean, it'd be really interesting to know how those people are doing it. Maybe that should have been a question. Uh, yeah. We, we've got a question coming up that's similar. Um, so it looks to be about 40% yes, 53% no, and 7% is blasphemy. So, uh, you know, that's still like uh sixty percent of people that we can convert. So that's that's good good to see. Um so we'll move to the next uh question. I think I just press up and down. Ooh, yeah, there we go. Um so this question is gonna be about your target goal for these these local beers. Why do you want to do it? Yes, be sure to check the chat too. Uh, I apologize if we switched out from the QR code too early, but um, our host has provided the web code as along with the code to get to this uh, to get to this poll. This is remarkably even. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting because when you read the literature, a lot of people say, you know, providing healthier options is the is the new um, reason probably for, for these low alcohol beer productions. But um, yeah, I'm wondering if maybe good. like that ties in quite a lot with the first one, the first category, which is embracing new demographics. Because that's it's often said to be a generational thing, right? Yeah, I mean, millennials are drinking less beer. Not my brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Making up for the for the rest of the art. <laughs> cool. Well, that yeah, remarkably, remarkably even. Uh, moving on, next question. There we go. I'm actually surprised about this too. I was kind of expecting more of a 50-50. Yeah, it's a funny one, GMO, because I, I actually read a report recently by um, Europa um, on consumer attitudes in the European Union on GMO. And actually it was like remarkably positive. Like most people didn't really seem to care that much. Um, and I think you're right. As sustainability and feeding the planet becomes more of a concern, it's it's going to become less of a an option to object. You know, if you need to feed people and the only way is to produce super efficient crops, it's it's probably going to have to be the way to go. Um, yeah. And I think I think really the big thing um, from the discussions that I've had with with people, uh, it's it's really more about transparency. Um, I think that that's the biggest thing, because at least in the U.S., I know that the food labeling laws don't necessarily require it, although I believe that's recently changed. Um but, but yeah, uh, like one of the biggest ways to lead towards consumer acceptance is more just being open about it and giving people options. Like, so somebody had mentioned in, in the comments about uh, Cosmic Punch from Omega, um, you know, there, so there are multiple options out there for U.S. brewers. You know, we have Sour, Valamon has Sour Vizier, Omega has the Cosmic Punch. There's a couple strains available. Um, 
through Berkeley Group. And they know what they're getting, though. Like, it's right on the package. It's not something that's that's trying to hide. Yeah. Right. Next slide. I think this is the final one from us. Here we go. Preferred method. If you were going to produce a low alcohol beer, what method would you go for? So this is a, a pretty kind of straight split between biological and the combination of the two. Um, yeah. It's interesting because um, I think, you know, mechanical has a lot of advantages. Um, mm -hmm. Probably the big disadvantage, particularly on smaller brewers, is that it's like really expensive to get hold of that kit in the first place. Um, so if you're going to do sure. it, you need to make sure that you've got the market to, you know, pay back on that uh, investment, um, which is... is tricky at the small scale i'd say yeah yeah so like definitely for someone or for a company that can't necessarily afford that new infrastructure i mean obviously biological is is the way to go from a um from an accounting point of view but you know and, and again too like the technology for the mechanical stripping of 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 ethanol is also changing as well it's becoming more efficient um you know, you have startups that can provide that service for you. I remember reading about the startup of the mobile canning industry, where um, you basically have a cannery in the back of a semi truck, and then it would just go to brewery to brewery and can beers for 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 breweries. I don't see how something like that with ethanol stripping wouldn't catch on, also, especially as um, you know, market preferences are shifting and non-alcoholic beer is becoming a growing part of the craft beer industry in particular. I guess if you were the person doing the, uh, the, the alcohol stripping as well, like that's a pretty valuable product you could obtain. Uh -huh. Um, so, you know, it could be, could be a win on two fronts. Right. Should we move on and do some questions? I will, um, yeah, yeah how to, uh, turn my screen off. <laughs> uh, it's not that button. It's this button. Yeah, don't don't hit the X. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say there's, there's there's two X's and one of them's the danger X. It kicks me out of the uh, out of the chat altogether. Um, right, let's start. Um, got one from Tim Foley um, who asks: Will high temperature mashing have influence on other factors such as the extraction of growth concentrations of tannins from husk material, causing husk flavors and colloidal stability issues downstream? Um, the answer there is, uh, is, is, is yes, um, definitely. Um, if you're mashing in a different fashion, um, you're going to be activating different enzymes at different times, and they'll have different effects on the uh, on the grain and on the downstream beer. Um, one thing that I didn't really go over is that the high temperature mashing technique is highly grain dependent. So if your um, statistics are changing with your maltster, if your diastatic power is changing, if your uh, blue kinase enzymes are changing, then it's going to have effects on the um, effectiveness of that process. Um, there's at least one paper out there that tries to model the um, high temperature mashing process mathematically um, using uh, results from regular brews uh, and the, the performance of those enzymes in those brews. Um, but yes, absolutely, it, it will have downstream effects uh, and it's something that you should consider. Um, how do I mark something as red? Oh, it does it automatically. There we go. Um, we'll skip. Will it be available for download? Um, certainly get in touch and I should be able to uh, get it to you. Um, could hop proof be an issue um, in heavy hops, low alcohol beers? Do you want to answer that, Abby? Cool. Yeah, I think that would fall into the category of stabilization. Um, I agree. 
It really depends on a number of factors as well, because hop creep can come from either the active enzymes within the hop material itself, or from the particular microorganism or microorganisms used for brewing. Uh, there's some really interesting papers that have come out within the last, gosh, like five years, part specifically on hop creep um, uh, that kind of lead to that direction. So um, I would say probably if, if the beer is not stabilized, um, that could potentially be an issue, especially if you're like you're using a lot of hops to compensate for, um, say, the weaker flavor of the low alcohol beer base. Agreed. Um, right. So next question: What options are there for a home brew with regards to stabilization of homebrew beer? Um, Henry low alcohol beer, I should say. Um, so, so my personal answer would probably be drink it really fast. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you didn't want to try that, you could look at using uh, sorbase and sulfur dioxide. I'm sure you can get them um, uh, for, for small homebrew quantities. Um, yeah, like sodium metabisulfite. Uh, you yeah. could also do home pasteurization. Um, it might affect the flavor of the beer just because it's not as super efficient as as a big brewery um, pasteurization system, but you know, just using a hot water bath or a very hot water bath for a set amount of time um, could go a long way in helping maintain the stability of an otherwise microbially unstable beer product. It should still be safe because the pH levels will be right. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't speak in in terms on absolute terms but yes it will be safe because the ph value is right and there's really nothing pathogenic that can grow even in low alcohol beer um, but with proper home pasteurization just using a hot water bath um, will help extend the shelf life of a low alcohol homebrew beer i have actually heard of people um making their own uh pasteurizers by packing their their, their cans or bottles into a, a lice or a mash tun and then spraying it. <laughs> so they're, they're spraying yeah. it with like 80 degree water and then they're quenching it afterwards with the switching. Yeah, they're basically, it's, it's kind of like a, a homebrew uh, tunnel pasteurizer. Exactly. Yeah. Um, moving on, is there a way to brew a full strength beer and then remove the alcohol using enzymes? Um, so we, we were, we actually saw this question before the chat and we were joking that you could add liver extract to it and it would uh, <laughs> break down your alcohol into, uh, into acetaldehyde and you get a hangover. Um, it, in reality, there isn't really like a, a commercial option for that. Um, there's a few papers out there that have experimented with using um, yeasts that will ferment or they'll, they'll respire aerobically and they'll use ethanol as a carbon source. Um, but again, they produce um, acetaldehyde, which doesn't um, really i mean it's poisonous you probably don't want to produce that um so there isn't really a good option for reducing it in that way but there has been some academic work done in that regard uh question from ed on low alcohol range um that really depends on the jurisdiction in which you're operating right so i mean in the uk we have a tax bracket between 0.5 and 1.2 percent which is called low alcohol, low alcohol and it's actually it's tax free um but it would but it depend very heavily on on where you're operating in the world. Um, I would check the local laws. Um, you know, anything between below about two point five percent for my money is like low alcohol beer. But it's um, yeah, if you're actually looking for a legal definition, I, I would check your your local laws. Yeah, for those of you in the U.S. Um, and I believe Canada, uh, low alcohol is considered zero point five to three point two percent. There you go. And then low alcohol, um, or sorry, no alcohol is anything less than 0.5%. Yeah, and I think low, no alcohol in the UK is less than 0.05%. Um, so, yeah. Fun fact that uh, sometimes a ripe banana has about 0.5% alcohol in it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to be getting drunk off this stuff. Um, so, what kind of products could be used for chemical stabilization um, of the beer after packaging? Um, probably before packaging, you couldn't really do that after packaging unless you were going to start bombarding it with UV light um, or x-rays or something, which they do do in like the food industry. 
Um, I've never heard of it being oh, done. Gamma rays. Yeah, yeah, oh, gamma rays. Um, yeah. You might find that you get similar sort of like reactions with hops as you do with UV light. So you might get kind of um, skunky aromas coming up. Um, I've never bombarded a beer with gamma rays, so I wouldn't actually know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm free this weekend, so maybe I could try. Um, Pre-packaging, you're talking sorbates, benzoates, and, and sulfur dioxide sources of sulfur dioxide. Um, can acid malt be used to lower mash pH? Yes, absolutely. Um, works very well. Um, two to five percent. I I would say that works very nicely. Um, it tends to also modulate your um, your runoff pH as well. So if you're sparging, even with um, water that isn't down at, at work pH, you actually find that a bit of um, acid malt in the malt uh, in the grist will actually regulate that pH rise quite nicely. So you can absolutely use um, acid malt for that reason. Um, is anybody using wineys? Yeah, there's a lot of um, wineys out there that genetically um, don't ferment maltose um, or maltotriose. So yes, you can use wineys for the alcohol beer production. Um, you might find there's Flavors that you don't want, we do want. Um, you might find it yeah. very well. But... One of the advantages, too, of wine yeast is that they also tend to produce quite a bit of glycerol, which, one, is a carbon sink, and two, um, can really help improve the mouth feel and body of a like just a low-gravity beer. Um, so don't underestimate the importance of just your standard stock yeast, too, uh, just because you choose that right strain, it could you could find something that works really well for you. Um, now, obviously, Andy and I, we can't really extol the greatness of our Enology yeast, but I will say I have worked with some of it in the past, and some of it, some of them do make some pretty good beer. <laughs> I agree. Um, final question is about sulfite and how much could be used um, for a 0.5% ABV with a final density of of 13 now that is quite a specific question um so we'd probably need to go away and do some maths to work out uh, how much sulfite you could use and um, what i would say is that in most countries there's legal limits to the amount of sulfite that you can use um in products and they usually yeah. uh, there is a requirement for labeling as well um in in fact um sulfite is actually produced naturally by brewing yeast and sometimes the level produced during fermentation is technically over the legal labeling limit so um Unlikely in a in a in a like kind of low alcohol fermentation, um, but definitely something to check before you go and uh, throw sulfate in. Just check how much is is legal for you to add. Um, one more question: The CBC yeast could be used to produce low alcohol beers instead of London and Windsor, uh, or could we use yeast killer property of CBC one to stop a standard fermentation? Uh, I'll let you go with that one, Abby. If you wanna? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's also a very specific question. It's, it's really interesting that you bring that up too, because we, we are doing studies on, um, the specific quantities required of the K1 or, you know, the killer toxins required to actually arrest fermentations. It tends to be much more sensitive in lower concentration or lower population values. Um, and this is important because just because the CBC one we we do know is killer positive and killer expressive, um, it may not necessarily produce enough killer yeast to actually subdue or kind of knock back a competitive population like that. Um, so it's more of like it's kind of like a use at your own risk kind of thing. Um, that we recommend just because we do know that it is killer possessive, but the actual nature of the killer toxin is very variable, depends on the environment that the killer toxin is being expressed in, depends on the other um, yeast that are present, the biodiversity of the culture or of the fermentation, etc. cetera. So uh, it it's, tends to be hard to, um, calculate that like even off the cuff but uh i wouldn't rely on something like cbc1 to help subdue or arrest fermentation i guess like even if it did work it's not going to be like an instant thing right it's going to be like right so... yeah it's more of an overtime so the other yeast will still have time to produce you know do their thing 
Cool. Well, I think that was our last question. Um, we'll probably wrap it up there because uh, Abby's got to get to the office and uh, I've got to pick up my child. Um, <laughs> I noticed there's more coming in. We will do our best to answer them um, by email. So do get in touch. I think the, uh, the email address is in the chat. Um, so send us an email uh, and we'll do our very best to get back to you. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It's been fun. I've enjoyed it. Yes, thank um, you. We'll hope to see you again at another Lalaman webinar. So I'm um, going to wrap it up now and say goodbye. Cheerio for me.